Hi and welcome to the show. Those who have been following the series know that it's all about inspirational people and people who encourage us and inspire us to be better. This week we have major veteran goddess that I bow before, like so many others, Miss Judith Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> when we have a star in our midst, we just you know, don't need any direction. How are you, darling? I'm rather fabulous, thank you. I guys. can see. I am. Now, you, she did fill me in that she's a bit hot at the moment. She's a bit hot. But because of the look, she'll sit here and stew for yes. the next one. But Vanity she, she looks terrible fabulous. Tea. No shine, if you see, skin flawless. Lovely. How's it been? How's things going? You went on holiday, didn't you? I was, I was in Gambia, my second home. I call it my spiritual home, Gambia. I love Gambia. So when did that start for you, Gambia? Three years ago. There's a guy called Marky B, and we work on the same radio station, or he used to be at the same radio station, Conscious Radio. Right. He was on before me, and he was telling me, oh, he's going to Gambia, and he's taking some DJs with him. I went, oh, you should take me. He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, you should take me. <laughs> and then I went on air afterwards, and I went on air, and I was going, um, Ma you must all phone Marky B and tell him, take Judith with him to Gambia. <laughs> and I, every week I went on air and I said that, and then he was getting harassed on air. And then he went, OK, Judith, you're coming to Gambia. <laughs> oh, OK, OK. <laughs> Thanks. So nice of you to send your mind. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it, a setup like one of those holidays abroad with parties and yeah, different Yeah, so DJs. I go there to play music. Right, OK. I so I go to Gambia and play music, and they think I'm a Don DJ, because they love reggae music. Right. In Gambia, they know reggae music better than Jumia Kanog reggae music, because the artist goes to Gambia, and they've got houses there, there's enough of them that go out there all the time. Right. And they see the lyrics word for word, and it's called Soul in Africa. So when we go out there, right. the other DJs are playing soul. I'm not, I have some soul, but it's not my team. I'm a reggae girl. <laughs> so when I start playing music, they're all kind of, what? She's a bad DJ, she's a bad DJ. I thought, oh, that's really funny. <laughs> if you met the real DJ, you, you, you wouldn't see that, because like, I'm the only one out there that's really running the reggae music at the time when Roy Medallion came out last year and this year. <sighs> and as a woman, it gives you a little slight edge. A little edge. Yeah, a, a little, little edge. edge. I tell you, the Gambia's always so much, hey, DJ, DJ. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so when did you start DJing? I, I was on another radio station before, before I was unconscious. It was a, called Soul. Oh, something Soul. It was set up by Emmanuel, who is um, Smiley Culture's nephew. Okay. And he set it up in remembrance for his uncle. Right. So he set it up, and there was a whole lot of DJs that was on there, and he asked me, would I do this? And I was like, you know I don't DJ, do that. yeah, 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 yeah. He said, but you could do that. I, mm -hmm. I don't. And then I was, mm -hmm. so then my, my motto in life now is to do things that frighten me, and it frightened me. And I thought, OK. I spoke to um, Ernie, Daddy Ernie, and I told him, he said, you can do that. I went, oh. I spoke to DJ Lange, you can do that. And I'm, oh, OK, OK. And they said, you, you could do this, you could do this. And because of them, I'd done it with this guy. We'd done it for like two years, and then it, it stopped. And then and I went, oh, I like this. So now the people that runs Conscious, I said, spoke to them, because there was a sound system called Intrepid Sound System. The guy that runs it used to be with Intrepid with my man. And that was my days, my youth days. And I was a <laughs> box gal. <laughs> was the sound system, the carrying speaker boxes. And we used to sit in the back of the van. Now, talk about self and safety. Back of the van with these speakers. They're not tied not down. Not tied. Just... And then we just sit in the speakers chatting away. Yeah, well, there, 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 there. And when I think back now, we could have been crushed to death. Them yeah, but experience. it never happens. So it kind of makes you think this self help and safety thing is a bit of an yeah. alarm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unnecessary, unnecessary alarm. We really did. And you know, my, my contribution was using wires and wiring up the wires because I wasn't going to pick up no speaker. And me and my girl were like, why? Why? I think, like, yeah, we're girl, we're spots, girl, we're boss, girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an interview of a million, I'm telling you. <laughs> now tell me about the beginnings for you, family. Where did you grow up? I was born here in England. Right. My parents are from Grenada. 
both my parents are from Grenada. Because I could hear the twang sometimes, and I wasn't sure if it was Trini, Grenadian, Guyanese. I wasn't yeah, quite well, sure. Yeah, well, I think my accent verges on all three of them. Because <laughs> in my house, we weren't allowed to have a Caribbean accent. We had to speak rather like this at home. Right. And any time, you, when you're in your, your repatriation, you're, you're like, yeah, and your mom, Kill it! <laughs> now my mother with her Caribbean accent, kill it! Don't talk like that! Don't, don't talk like that! Not even saying Judith, you know. Judith! Judith! <laughs> I was like, alright, so we're like, And we all wanted to be like, so we had to leave it at the house and, and talk with us. And then talk like that. So yeah, so we, I was brought up in Finsbury Park. Okay, North London girl. North London girl. Loved, loved, loved living in Finsbury Park. Did not understand. Why my dad used to get upset when I'd come home and say, "Oh, the, the cars are driving really slowly down the road, and there's what? Where was the car? Where was the car? Oh, it was just behind me. It was really slow. I don't understand why these cars keep driving so slowly. Like my dad will come out. And my police cars? No, no. Prostitution on our road. No, stop it. Finsbury Park was the bed of prostitution, and, and I didn't. I, I'm, I'm this naive. Even right now, I don't know his anything. Anywhere, yeah. so, so I walk around like this blinkered, and I didn't notice anything. My dad would be like, "What?" And he'd be putting on his slippers and running. Down his What's the matter with him? Why is he getting so upset? Because he literally would have a little fit that they were following his daughter. And oh, what right. they think? What do they think he's going to do? What do they? What do they going to do with you? What? <laughs> Okay. All right, calm down. <laughs> so I didn't know. So I, I, I stopped telling my dad when the cars used to follow us down the road because it just gave a little heart failure. Uh, yeah, so Finsbury Park. Grew up Finsbury Park. Loved Finsbury Park. And where did you go to school? Um, in Ambler, Finsbury Park. My primary school was Ambler. Right. And my school was like, like five minutes from Whoa. where we lived. Yeah. Right. So school started at nine and we left home at nine. Because it's round the corner. You think you're going to get there at On the time. Same. And that, that, always it's late. Always, always, always late. Always late because it's just literally round the corner. And Finchley Park, the park itself, was down the road. And I was having this conversation about as children, you had your clothing, you had your home clothes. Absolutely. You had your school clothes. Correct. You had your going out clothes. Correct. We don't do them things no more. <laughs> but we don't have to, I suppose. Well, I suppose. And maybe we should bring it back. Maybe. Because it was good discipline. It was. But also, because I didn't realise, again, I didn't know I was poor until I was older. You didn't know you were poor? I didn't know I was poor. I know we had to have. It's when, when people say, oh, you know, so we had to wear our children, our, our brother's clothes. And me down. And me down. So I was like, yeah, well, we did that. I didn't even know what latchkey meant. And they said, you know, when you walk around your key, I said, I was a latchkey. What does that even mean being a latchkey? <laughs> My mum wasn't home. That's a latchkey because your parents went in. You had to let your. You were at work. Uh, they and were at work. work yeah. Of course, they're earning their work and their little bottoms off for us. It was four children at the time because my baby sister. I was going to say, how many of the siblings? Five of us all together. It was four of us at the time. And where were you in the lineup? I'm the middle. Okay. Like the firstborn here. Okay. So it's, you know, I haven't got that middle child syndrome. I was going to say, middle child syndrome. No, <laughs> because I was born here. I was firstborn. Right, okay. So I was always in my head. The first. The first. <laughs> and because so, and my, my older brother and sister was in Grenada. Right. And then they came over. So you really didn't feature them like that. It's like, they're over there, I'm the first, okay. Didn't it's even know about all them. about me. Didn't it? It was all, <laughs> it was always all about me. I did not know about them, but I remember my, there was all these young people that was in our house, and it felt like a, like a pick and mix because I, my auntie was going, I'm like, look, this one seemed like to me. I'm going to have these two. And somebody said, no, I'm going to have that one. And then we were left with two others. I'm like, nobody wanted you lot, so that's why you have to stay here. Well, those that got to stay here were my brothers and my sisters. But I didn't know my brothers and sisters. I didn't know those were my cousins. They were all brought over from Grenada. And it was like, it was literally like a ticket mix, but some of the parents <laughs> they were coming to pick up their children. I love yes, that one, yeah. Yes, they were coming to pick up their children. And I didn't know. I didn't know them my family. I didn't know them. And so I was the boy, well, it was my, my dad, my dad, taught me how to do electrical stuff, this. I was his boy. Right. And then the real boy came, my brother. <laughs> OK. And messed everything up. Well, you know that didn't work for me. <laughs> that was not working for no, you. We had a year of total fighting. <laughs> me and my Only brother, a year? I will. But I tell you why it stopped. It stopped because at night time you said to When you tea. murdered him. Well, okay. almost. <laughs> but it almost, almost. It was, oh, cool. So, 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 so. 
Not tell me I had to make tea for the family. <laughs> and so me and my brother's making tea, as we always did. And so we had the kettle and the pot of tea. So I said, well, let's do an arm wrestling competition. Because I'm, I'm, my brother's older than me, but I don't care. No man is going to be better or stronger or faster than me. So, all right. so he's taking me, and I can see he's taking me. So as I'm going down, I'm dragging the tablecloth with me. and I, Burn up the child. So I put, I put it myself. <laughs> oh, yourself? Oh. I, and I have taken to the hospital. And then they beat my brother. My dad beat my brother so badly, so badly. I cried for my brother. Because that was just, it was my fault. i done it. I wanted to do the hand, the, the wrestling competition. I dragged the thing on me, but my brother got the blame for it. Right. And we sat down and we literally went, we're not going to argue anymore. And we shook hands on it. That was it. And what age was that? Um, I would have been, I was still at primary school, so I'd have been about 10. Wow. 10, 11, maybe just before primary school. Yeah. So you called the truth at we 10 called, years ago? Yeah, we called the truth because it was horrible. My bro was beaten so horribly. It was horrible. Yeah. And I was like, no, this is our argument. It's nothing to do with you, no. <laughs> <laughs> involved. This is us. <laughs> Actually, it's because of you, Dad. Treating him like a boy and no longer treating me like a boy, and I was, I was yeah. It actually, right. it's your fault. It is your fault. It's my dad's fault, actually. Why? Why? So yeah, we made a pact, and that was it. My brother was the best brother that you could ever hope to have. He always, always, always had my back. But he had all of our backs, to be fair. Right. But he always had my back. All right, that's nice. Mm. When you have a brother that's more like a second father, looking out for you, because that's my relationship with my brother. He's older. I, didn't know, I don't know anything about sibling rivalry that I hear people talking about. Yeah. <laughs> he and I, it's just like, it's always been, I've got a second father. <laughs> yeah. How many of you are there? Only two. Oh, I'm two boys. Yeah, two okay. boys. Okay. That's more than enough. Yeah. So, with all of this, they only want to. <laughs> yeah, In fact, they, they wanted to send this one back. They may not be able to. They wanted, oh, to, send to, <laughs> they wanted to send this one back. Oh, really? <laughs> A nightmare. Anyway, we're here to talk about you, darling, not me. So, <laughs> so how was school for you? Did you enjoy school? I loved school. Thank I, you. I love when people say they love school. I love school. They thought, my parents told me I was intelligent. I believed I was intelligent. The school believed I was intelligent because my parents told me I was intelligent. I told them I'm intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I was the top streamer. That was the time of streaming. Right. And I was the top. And then, um, and then when I went to secondary school, they because of my primary school, they, they put me, at the, but they didn't put me in the right group. I was in the group with, well, I was a group of people that became my friends. But my mum was like, what is this? What is, no, 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 this is not right. And we went to school. You know, my daughter's an A-class student. And they were like, oh, we made a mistake, yeah. sorry. Who are these people you put my child with? Exactly. <laughs> put me up. I liked it because I didn't have to think very much. It was actually, the, it, the work was so easy. You know when you just look, oh, yeah, I can do this. It was yeah. great. I really felt intelligent then. And then they moved me to the other group. Which uh, changed now, the dynamics now completely. Now I had to start thinking. <laughs> I had to actually start using my mind and start doing stuff, but it was good for me. And, and, I, and I, like, I like the competition. I would always sit with people that was deemed the intelligent ones in my right. class, and we'd all do the questions and stuff and things. But I'd go, what did you do? Would you? Okay, let's see who was right then. <laughs> okay, they got it right. But it's okay. I'll get right <laughs> next time. <laughs> but it's good that you used it, the competition as in, yes. to inspire you to be better. Yes. Because that's always the way, isn't it? You look at the the ones that you think are there. You don't look down to follow the ones that are down there. You no. look up there because even if you don't reach there, you'll reach a lot higher Absolutely. if you look up there than if you look down there. Yeah, well, that, I, I was never allowed to look down there yeah. anywhere. My parents always was so, so well, yes, I always did. And because of them, it made me, it did make me competitive. And I always looked at the people that I thought were, either faster than me, if it's, if it's to do with sports, more intelligent than me, I'd hang out with them. Anything that I think that people are better yeah. than me, and I hang with them. raise your game. Yeah, it helped raise my game. So that streaming was secondary school? Yeah. Right, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you left school at what age? I left, because I was doing my A-levels. OK. See, bright girl. Yeah, well, my parents wanted me to go to uni because I was going to be the uni child. That in the family. <laughs> Didn't get to boarding school, got to uni. And, and then I had, so it was 17, I had an audition for a series called Angels. 
and because I was working anyway before Angels, I was doing sharp jobs. Jumping Beanbag was my very first television series. I only stand telly. Now let's go back a bit. What was your first job when you left school? Well, did you go straight into acting? I was acting whilst at school. Oh, right. Okay. So, so when did the acting start for I you? Started, How did it start? Um, Eleven. I was. Oh right. Yes. Yeah, my secondary child school. Child actress. Um, I was a child actress actually. Okay. <laughs> Still acting. <laughs> <laughs> there was a woman, or a girl, because she was called May, and she was going to a place called Amish's. Yes, drama. Right. And, 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 and it's still going today. And it's still, well, in, in a shadow. I'll, I'll explain that a bit later. But, um, so when we started, it was in Essex Road. Right. And it was, in the, it was in a block of flats, and they had a hall, and we used to go there. And I went there, and there was a waiting list. It was six months of waiting list at that time, which felt like an eternity. Yeah. It became four years after later on. It was only six months at that time. So then I got in, and, and my dream, I always wanted to act at primary school. That's right. Giving all the acting roles, because I was going to be an actress. At that. And my dad was like, mm, do, you, do you see any black people on telly? I'm going to be on telly. Uh, and my 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 mum bought me this book about Hollywood actresses, and it showed you this actress getting up, and it, had, it was just a strip along the line. It said this actress had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to be at makeup for six o'clock. She finished studio at eleven, went to bed, and had to start all over the next day. And mum said, mm, "Do you know you don't like getting out of bed? This is what's going <laughs> This sounds fantastic. I want to do this. I want to do this. So it didn't work the way my mother thought yeah, it was going to work. It was it reversed. Well, yes. <laughs> so I was doing all this stuff. So when I went to secondary school, went to Anna Shears, had my very first audition for a BBC play for today called Jumping Beanbag. It was originally called um, Slag Bag. But because it's BBC, slag bag was not going to be allowed to be said. I remember Play for Today. Play for That's Today. That's like in the 70s. Yes. Yeah, oh. they were big to be the play for that. And yeah. I was a Donny Osmond fan. Yeah, not not a Jackson Five. Fan. <laughs> I mean, really, how cool for your cred is that? Nothing wrong with a little bit of one bad apple don't spoil the whole. Okay. That is Jackson's. No, it's not. That's the Osmond. That's the Osmond. Well, do your research, honey. Oh, give me one more chance. chance. Really? Anyway, I liked the Osmonds. Yeah, anyway, I liked the Osmonds, but Did you like that? never <laughs> compared to the Jackson Of course Five. not. <laughs> anyway, so that was my first job, and I, she, she was talking about the Osmonds, and yeah, she had to go pay money. Now, I can't remember what I'd done la yesterday or last week, and I, yeah, I can remember this job that I'd done uh, how many years ago I can remember vaguely the lines that I'd done, because my very, very first professional job that I ever got to do. Right. So, so I got to do Jumping Beanbag, and that was the days of the GLL, GLR, GLA. And you had to go down there. This, it was the South, it was called South Bank. Um, as child, children, we had to go there to get weighed and measured, and we had to get a chaperone to take us around, and they had to check yeah. that, you, that you were getting, and you only work X amount of days in a year because you're a child, and you get your school. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And my school was so wonderful for me. It was a girls' school. They let cross. you. They let me. Gave you the freedom yeah. to pursue it because yeah, well, they knew some that's what I schools to do. could be a bit. Well, no, we're not giving any time off. No, no, no. They did do that with some people. Yeah. But they didn't do that. I'm just, I'm, See, she's always been school. special. Hey, darling, I would have had to leave school <laughs> and say, I'm citing the reason this because you're trying to stop me from getting a profession. <laughs> They didn't do that. <laughs> they were very good, and they all knew what I wanted to do, and they kept saying, Jules, as much as we can help you, we're going to help you to do what you want to do. That's lovely, though, that yeah, you had the support. School. And did you have the support from your family as well? Yes. My mother was absolutely amazing because it doesn't sound like a lot of money in these days, but you had to join equity when I was... Those were the days of equity. Yeah, yeah. important. So if you weren't in equity, you couldn't work, but you couldn't work unless you were in equity. And before you got your full membership, you, you had the little red thing, and you had to pay, I think it was like 15 pounds a year, I think it was. That was so much money. <laughs> in those so, days. Well, they used to get shillings in those yes, days as payments, yes. so. And my mother said, okay, if that's gonna make you good, we're gonna do this for you. And I was like, oh, okay, so she was, she was Amazing. It's nice that they supported you and uh, as much as they possibly could in their capacity to fulfill. My your... mum wanted to be an actress. Oh. And when she was at home, she had a home being Grenada. Uh -huh. She apparently was offered a role where she had to be watching the horses and going, yes, yes, sir. 
But my dad didn't want her to do it, so she didn't do it. And that was the time of, that was the era of, was the, well, my husband doesn't want me to do right, it, so. She didn't yeah. do it, this is in Grenada. And so my mom said, uh-uh, you're, that's not happening to you, you're going to do it. So. And at, living a little bit of her dream yes, through you. Yes, at 17, when I'd got eight jobs, because I was meant to be the uni child, don't forget, and my dad's going, so, so you're not going to go to university? You're going to be going and doing this acting thing that you know is not very secure? How, what people, you know, what people come out? And my mom said, Henry, <laughs> that's what Judith wants to do. That's what she's going to do. Judith, you want to do that? That's what you're doing. And she was probably more determined to support you uh -huh. because she wanted to do it. Yeah. And, you know, she happened. gave it up because of... So the screen of my very, she did see me on other stuff, she saw me on the um, Play for Today and stuff, but this is the very first screening of my first episode of Angels that I left school for. My mother died the night before. No. She never saw it. She never saw the job I left home for. How old were you when you did that? 17. 17. And what was the role she, in the Angels? Because I, I, I remember. Beverly Slater. She was a nurse. A nurse? Yeah, I was, all, I was, I was there for three years. Uh, three is my lucky number. I was there. Angels. Angels. Wow, yeah. that's a memory. And that was a learning process. I wasn't drinking at that time. Well, Not like now. I, I stopped drinking at 16, which always sounds very weird. I, I, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, I had a fight. I was on my way to go to my drama class. And, as and trust me, she does drama. I do <laughs> drama. <laughs> and as I'm coming at the flats, I can hear, oh, your sister's having a fight. Your sister, I said, what? And my sister, Jan, she's no longer here. Janice was my, was my, me and Janice was born here. And right. Elliot and Cynthia was born in Grenada. And Mandy is the baby. Everybody loved Mandy because she wasn't part of the group in the baby. <laughs> but Janice is like my blood, my heart, my heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and almost like twins. Almost, well, people used to think she was me because yeah, so it was <laughs> almost like twins, absolutely. So what? So what's going to fight? And when I came in the flat, it was a big girl from my flats was trying to fight my sister. And my sister's like, don't mess around my sister. My sister's like what you call Talawa. She's little, but she's <laughs> one tough cookie. I don't fight. My sister was the one that used to fight all the time. Me and... I'm just too pretty. <laughs> and, and I came into the flats and I said, oh, no, you can't be doing this. So I jumped in. I don't fight. I only fight for my family. Yeah. yeah. Jumped in. And we're having this fight. Da, da, da. And then... But I remember spitting something out of my mouth, and then and they got separated, and we went to the house, sat there, and my parents were really proud of me because I was defending my sister, you know, and has to do. No teeth. No, they, so I'm sitting there, and then um, I couldn't think, my mouth felt really weird, and there's like blood in my mouth, it really was. Then a brick came through my window saying, you bit off my earlobe, poof! I went, what? Bit what? So I was like, I couldn't understand what she was talking about. So I went outside to search the floor, and there was this bit of earlobe on the floor, because I bit off her earlobe. They don't call her Mike Tyson for nothing. Well, you see, Tyson learned from me. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Do you know what was so sick? I picked up this earlobe. And gave it back to her, don't tell me. I put it in my purse. Then I went home, because I felt sick, because just outside the flats, so I came back to my room, and then I poured myself a pint glass of Bacardi, and vodka, and beer. My parents were all sitting there with all their friends, and I poured it all out, and I'm drinking, drinking, drinking. And then I was waking up in the morning, and my mother bringing me some fried eggs, and me looking at the eggs, and thinking, oh, no. and <laughs> the toilet seat was broken. Mum, the toilet seat, yes, if you did that last night when you went to the toilet, because I obviously was drunk. I wasn't even 15. 15, I was 15 at the time, I was 16, 15. And then, um, and I couldn't eat the egg, because the texture of the fried egg reminded me of the Of the egg. air. So has that put you off eggs for life? It did for ages. I can now eat it again. But it took me about 10 years before I could go eat that again. Then they took, they, I had to go to court because no. they took me to court, the family took me to court. And my school was going, oh, because I, I was a prefect. I was a really... <laughs> exactly. I was She's a perfect head, example. She's a head girl. I was the perfect example of what a child, <laughs> Judith, should be. And uh, when they were saying to me, I said, oh, I stole an apple in 
the market. I said, they're taking you to court for stealing an apple. I said, yeah, I would not tell anybody I was in a fight because that's just not... I, I was not proud of it. It was not a proud moment in my life. So I literally told... The only people that knew it was my girlfriend, Pat, my girlfriend, Shirley, my two girls I hanged around in school. They were the only that knew the truth. Everybody else thought I'd stolen an apple, and that's why I was going to court. My dad. Johanna, they go, you don't have to call me Johanna. Johanna! <laughs> She's a good girl. She's a good girl. She does so well in school. Please don't ruin her. And I'm sitting there going, Dad, you're really embarrassing me. <laughs> I'm like, all over. Please, Anna, please, I beg you. She's a very good girl. And then my school wrote the most amazing thing about me because I was top person in the studio. And, um, and they went, we can see that you're actually, this must have been a really or one-off thing, and you're not like that, so you've got a 12-month suspended sanction, and it'll be wiped off your records after that, because we know that you're like, yeah, result, result. Because it's not like me. I only do it because my sister. <laughs> the two fights I've had in my life is because of my sister. Because I had to protect her. She's my baby. There's no way I'm having people butt up my sister. <laughs> but I'm pathetic. I'm not a fighter. I am so not a fighter. I've done martial arts to help me get some nerves so that I can fight. Because I'm so <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> well, that's good. You don't want to be going around the street and fighting. I Come know. On. But my friends weren't like me. My friends were ready for a ruck at any moment. Whereas I'm like... You know, I'm just going to go to the shop. <laughs> I know that we're going to about to have a fight, but I just need to go to the shop. Just one moment, one minute. I'll yeah, I'll there. be back in a I'll second. <laughs> no, it's not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> the shopping taking a very long time. <laughs> so you started with Angels. Yes. Where did it go from there? So Angels is what I left school for. Uh -huh. Stayed there for three years because my magic number, I love number three. 13 is my favorite number, so three is one of them. And then whilst we were doing Angels, um, Welcome Home Jacka, Black Theatre Co-op started doing stuff. And the producers were Tony Holland and, um, Tony Holland and Julia Smith were the producers of, of, of Angels. Right. And they came back to me, oh my God, there's these amazing people doing all this work, and there's these black actors, and they're doing this, and it was my friends, Victor Romero Evans, Chris Thomas. They were my brethren. They were talking about my brethren like that. I, was like, I know them. I know them. They're my friends. <laughs> they were so in awe about the work that they were doing. Yeah. So then when I left Angels in three years, I then joined Black Theatre Co-op and done my first theatre production. I'd never done theatre before that. Right. So 17... So you're one that went straight into TV. Straight to TV. So I didn't start... Because more often than not, it invariably is the other way around. They like call it treading the boards in theatre, and then, you know, you get your TV roles. Yeah, because it's getting your spirits, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. so when I was doing... Um, so I got my theatre job, and that was... So it was... Um, Trevor Leard was directing it. Oh, OK. And Trevor went, you're not getting a close-up now, Judith. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Said, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Because, of course, television's like this. Yeah. Theatre's like this. Absolutely. So I'm doing my own white acting, you know, very intense work. Oh, no, yeah, oh, no. Oh, no. yeah, yeah. Who, who can hear that? Who can hear that, Judith? Yeah. Okay, okay, then fine. I've got to project. Let's get back to some projecting. And as you can see, she's still projecting. I'm not projecting. I have not gone back. <laughs> <laughs> Once you start to project, you don't go back. But my first theatre production was with a woman called Pauline Black, um, selector, yeah. sleeve singer. And, um, oh God, there was a couple of people on there. The guy, he done Ben, he went on to do London's Burning. But anyway, whilst we're doing, we were, uh, it was our first night, or maybe our second night, and one of the actresses had decided that one of the actors was just not worthy to be on stage. She made this unilateral decision, it's at Riverside Studios, that she was not coming back out. We're starting our play, she's not coming back out because she does think that actor's not very good. So she's not coming out. So I'm standing on the stage, waiting for this woman to come out, because it was a two-handed. We, we started the play, and she's decided she's not coming out. So this is opening night. You started the play. Audience are there. Audience is there. You are standing now, done your bit, and waiting to yeah, cue so for started, her it to. It must have been like the first half. We've done about a few scenes already. So while we do the scene, she's decided that he's just not good enough for her to be grace her presence with her on stage. 
So she's not coming back out. So I'm standing there trying to remember her lines, my lines, thinking that I could just make it a monologue. And then, then I got confused. I couldn't remember what her lines were. And then I got frustrated and I started crying on the stage. No. Um, when I marched off the stage now, right? And if you don't know, that's the play, isn't it? Because you don't know what's going on. <laughs> you accept whatever you see. Yeah, my it's partner was in the audience. And he went, no. Something's not right something's here. Not right here. This is Judith. Is, this is Judith Crane. This is not her acting crime. This is her crime. Anyway, then they had to ask, they said, oh, we're going to call an interval now. An interval in the first half, in that 15 minutes, 20 minutes into the first half, we have to call an interval. Because we had to have an emergency meeting backstage to tell what the fuck was going on. She said, I'm not coming what, back What now. was going on? That was the cut? Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The movie is going yeah. on. <laughs> and so she um, said, oh, no, he's just not good enough. Da, 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 da. But we had to finish the play, so... Yeah, because audience are out there, paid their money, they're so we had here. to recast, we had to do it in a week, because we had to keep her in for a week and get somebody in to be able to play the part. Well, what was that play called? <sighs> Trojans. Okay. Trojans. And, because uh, I've never had any breast, and you may, this is a good bra, but I haven't had any breasts <laughs> forever. <laughs> and in this, in the first review we had was a music review, because they came because of Pauline. And they said, oh, Chief looks like she was Barbara Windsor when her, uh, with, with tits for guns. And I thought, well, I've never had any breasts. That's quite amazing. I actually really liked that review because <laughs> people tried to insult me, but actually, you <laughs> gave me a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was great. She's going to be Jews. They're just trying to get at me. That's why they've done the review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But that, my first theatre production was a total nightmare. Well, it's probably he gave you the confidence and thought, well, you know what? It can't get any worse. Well, it couldn't get any worse. <laughs> <laughs> it could not, Barry, it could not get any worse than that. Standing on stage waiting for an actress to come that out. That doesn't come out because she's decided, no, I'm not coming out. And you're thinking, now, how can I make this work? Can I make it a monologue like I'm talking to myself? But I can't remember her lines. So what <laughs> I'm going to do is burst into it tears is, I and run up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Basically. That was how I solved the situation. Well, so from there, it was obviously onwards and upwards. It could only get better. <laughs> it could only get better. So I've done a few more productions, Trinity and stuff. And then um, Humphrey Barclay, who was the head of LWT, London Weekend Television, came to Black Day to come and asked her to devise something. We had Farouk Dondi and Mustafa Matura. They were the writers. Okay. And it was myself and, and, um, and Charlie Hansen was also on it as a producer. So we had myself, uh, Chris Tummins, Victor Romero Evans, my star, Malcolm the most amazing man, Ma Malcolm Frederick, yeah. Janet Kay, Show Pressure Dende, who's now called Fumi, and there was a young Asian girl who was in Angels with me, actually. Why well, can't I remember her? And I can't remember her. I can't remember her name. I can't remember her, but I remember all the others. Yes. And we'd, we've had um, Chris on the show. He's come and, and told us his story as He's well, so which talented, was, talented. was great. Really talented. And we devised that. Now, I say we devised it. We were doing lots of... Now, the name is no problem, of course. Right. So, right. But we were working on lots of different ideas. And then it was for me, Chopin, who played Terry, came in and gave everybody a character. And she said, right, you're called Santa Samelia, you're called Bellamy, you're called Toshiba. And then... Once she gave us the, the titles and the vague thing about what started to take shape and yeah, go and into the characters, it, and it was no problem was born. Because Malcolm was Bellamy. No, Malcolm. No, Victor was, was Bellamy. Victor was Bellamy. Bellamy. Malcolm was BC. Chris, BC, that's right. And Chris was <laughs> Toshiba. Because I always remember it simply because of Chicken Toshiba. When he made the dish, when he was cooking. Gosh, oh gosh. That has stuck in my head as if it was yesterday. Chicken Toshiba. Chicken Toshiba, I don't even remember that until you said it. You remember that now? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, honestly, that was not a job. That was just going to meet your friends. And hang out. And hang and out. And laugh and, and get paid for what you love. Paid. I tell you, like, we, I'd get up in the morning, go to work, and we had a card game called Speed. And it was to have to really be quick. Janet was excellent on it, and me and her used to try to beat each other on it. Then it'd be like, um, can we come rehearse the scene? What? <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see I'm playing cards? <laughs> what is the matter with you? <laughs> All right, give me 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 what are we there 
platform to play speed. We come to meet each other to have play games and cards. It was, I, I love. People always talk about Real McCoy, but no problem is my favorite job. Really? Because we devised it, because of my brothers and sisters. Yeah, you created it. it, yeah. It was just love. It was just pure love when we were recording. How long did that series run? Three years. And only because Janet and I were both pregnant on the last series. Right. I don't know if they would have commissioned another one, who knows, but we were both pregnant. I wasn't allowed to show my pregnancy right. because we didn't want to show that only two black women in the show were both pregnant. Pregnant at the same time, yeah. So Janet was allowed to allow her belly to the show. Mine and you, was covered yeah. all the time. <laughs> you had to remain a holy nun. Yay, <laughs> yay, nothing like that. <laughs> but then we had, on our very last episode, we had Aswad with us. And yeah, I remember we that. Had, it was the best, because Janet was going into labor, and we were doing a song. And every time she went, she went, oh, went, oh that's a good move. Oh, oh, oh. Well, it was her going into labor. And every time she'd done a new thing because she was in labor, we had it into the song. <laughs> Honestly, we had a ball, a ball, a ball, a ball, a ball, do it, no problem. What and that ran from when? I was trying to put a date on it, and I can't remember exactly. Was it end of the 70s, early no, 80s? No, it was 80s. Okay. It was... Um, uh, I she was born 85, so it was just, yes, yeah, so it was 82, 83, 82, 83, 84, no, so it must be, she was born 85, so that's when we would, the last ep series would have been done. So that's what it was, 85. 85 was the last of it. Yeah, it was a household day with the weekends. Do you know, right, I had done Angels before I'd done that, and I, Angels, totally freaked me out. Literally on the bus one day, nobody knows you, the next day everybody's staring at you and I had to get off the bus and cry and phone my man. There was no mobiles, I had to look at my phone box. <laughs> and phone him and say, hey, Daddy's everybody staring at me, he's everybody. I'm like, oh, calm down, calm down, dude, what's going on? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And he went, oh, all right, dude, how many people do you see on telly on the bus? None. He said, that's why they're staring at you. <laughs> exactly, calm down, it's a good thing, darling. <laughs> Anyway, I'm walking to your workplace now. So I was in Finch Park and I walked it to Warren Street because there was no way was I getting on a bus again. To For people to stare at you. And so that was that one. But when we done No Problem, it was our people. Every, it was such a different feel. All right. It was The recognition and, and then, yeah. But for real, for No Problem, it felt like I'd just come back into the business. Right. I've been in the business for ages. But it was just, it was, it was a so fresh much love. So much love given to recognition. us. Yeah. yeah. We went to the room. From your own community, I yeah, guess, it was, which oh, makes it was more so of a difference. Yeah, it was so beautiful. So, so beautiful. So we, done, we went to the Reggae Awards where Tony Williams was used to put on the Reggae Awards. And I have no word of a lie. This is when I felt like we'd arrived. We walked, we, we, we were just walking in like this. Nah, 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 nah. I walked into the room, nah, nah, nah. the room was like, the room was like this. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and you're looking behind you going, we were going like, Me and Victor Jack were going like, why did we stop talking? <laughs> okay, okay. I saw women started to come in, because women, it was the women coming after Victor and Tummins and, 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 and Malcolm. And they went, okay, guys, can we just put you up to another room? So they had to take us and put us in another room. We sat there going, what happened there? <laughs> oh my God! You don't forget, we've all done stuff. I've just done angels for three years. Did I get that kind of, no. Yeah. We had to sit in there for a while, let people forget that we were there. Then they brought us into a table, let us sit down on the table. And then women started rushing the table. <laughs> now, Victor had his then girlfriend with him. This is his girlfriend sitting here. This is Victor sitting here. <laughs> we all grow up here. And this poor D sitting there going, like, oh, his girlfriend sitting there, oh, it's all right, I don't exist, it's fine, it's fine. Don't mind me. I've never seen me. They, none of the men was doing that for us. Let <laughs> Let's be clear. It's, they're very clear. My man was sitting there going to, I was going to him, well, this is very upsetting, isn't it? Why are they pushing you out of the way so that they can ask me? <laughs> they just didn't get the memo, did they? They didn't, didn't get, get the, the memo. memo. <laughs> they, they only rushed the man and them. All the girls, them. that was, that was very funny. I've never, that made me feel about, when you watch people on the telly, the major, the big major stars have people react to them. Yeah. That's how our community reacted to us on, on that, on, at that awards. It was something else. So no problem came to an end. Yeah. What followed that for you? 
baby because I was pregnant. <laughs> and, and I went up for jobs when I was pregnant because I, I was never going to have a child. And then I was pregnant. I thought, you know, OK, let's have a child. And then, so I was having an audition. I said, oh, I was, so I was due to start this new series that I was wanting in six weeks after I gave birth six weeks later. But then the guy who was directing it was replaced. And so the person that replaced him wanted to cast, recast. It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because there was no way I was going to leave my baby. I didn't think I'd get like that. I didn't think I was going to be all maternal. And I never wanted a child, so I didn't think it was going to be a thing. I just sat Well, at least you're brutally honest. Is that <laughs> you, you, in, in your mind, you thought, no, I don't want a child. And I didn't get in the way. And then you're like, oh, but I made this. It's mine. <laughs> She was so beautiful, so cute. She looked like her dad, which is always very upsetting. <laughs> but, but, but she, there was, I thought, six, I thought, imagine I wanted to leave you at six weeks. How could I have left you at six weeks? What would you have done at six weeks? And I'm talking to her like she knew. It was, and I just thought, no way. So actually, it was a blessing that I didn't get that job. Right. I didn't get the job, but I didn't have the job because a new director came in and wanted to And do, recast. And yeah. recast and stuff. And then, um, and I'd done some other stuff, not a lot of stuff, but some stuff. And then, Julia Smith and Tony Holland were behind EastEnders. They were the producers of EastEnders. And so they asked me, would I be interested in coming into EastEnders? So I had to think about it for a whole two seconds and go, yeah! <laughs> as long as two seconds? Uh, I think it was a whole two seconds. It might have been a second and a half. But, it, you know, it was... And so I came into EastEnders because they asked me if I would be interested to be in it. What was your role in EastEnders? Carl Bell, the health visitor. There was a character called Linda Davison, and she was the punk. And I yeah. came to look after her child initially. And then it sort of spread out. You and Dr. Leg. Dr. Leg. <laughs> oh, Dr. Leg made a reappearance not too long ago. Really? I still watch EastEnders. I, I love oh, you still it. follow? Yeah, I love it. So, so then, how long were you in EastEnders? My magic number. That is really your magic number, isn't it? It's following Three you years through. in Angels, three years in No Problem, three years. And I choose to leave after three because it's my favourite number. And if I don't leave at three, I'd have to stay till seven because that's my next number. So I left at, at, at three. At three? Yeah, left EastEnders after three years. And um, done this with it. And then Will McCoy came about. Now... My one of my, I mean, I've got several favorite scenes actually from Real McCoy. I was amazed, people always mind the stuff I don't even remember. So let me see if I remember this one. Go ahead. Mother Church Shoes, <laughs> Father Cecil G, <laughs> Father Shame Come in the Dark, Shame <laughs> Guy. <laughs> Father comes in the dance switch on the light. You got on your mother church shoes. <laughs> and what are you doing in Michael Beach? Have you been in any dances when oh, you when you went to wrong school, darling? You wouldn't have done it. Oh no, listen, I've done my fair share of shoe beans, don't you? Uh, worry? Uh, <laughs> I've been at dances when that happened. <laughs> and you know what? That, that our parents don't care about how it's a shape. They don't care. With the rollers in the living head and the <laughs> scarf and slippers. <laughs> <laughs> Not my mother, thank goodness for that. No, but no, no, I've no. been there, and you're like, no, don't shame your child like that. We're all hiding, we're thinking our parents might be right, might be right them. behind them. Absolutely, because you know you're not supposed to be in there you're at that age anyway. At that time as in well. In your father's Cecil G and your mother's church. And you know where we got it from? Because it literally that's what we did used to do. My dad did have the Cecil G. And my, yeah. In fact, that was his Cecil G I was wearing on the show. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was Mr. Mr. Smart, Mr. Smart man, and I can say he's And yeah, we were, we were, that was the fashion and the style. And yeah, that was the just, box pleat skirt. Box pleat skirt, because you had the sticks, man. <laughs> and you remember sticks, man? Of course. The sticks, man, and the girls wore the box pleat. That's but right. I realised we were wearing all the Jewish women's clothing. Because I went to Jewish people's shops to be able to buy my clothes at yeah. the time. But who thought about it? We, we did. We just spent money on these. Box pleats, skirts, check, box pleats, skirts, yeah. and, and the guys frilly blouse with it. And oh, the guys yeah. used to get their trousers made, because my brother used to always get his trousers made. There was a bit of the high waistband, you'd have the one zip or the three zips, or the Farah jeans, or Farah trousers. And all this stuff is money stuff, you know. And where are these people getting all this money from? Where, because they were sticks, man. Yeah, exactly. You then you money. go around full circle, you understand where the sticks, man, comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember the Crocs. The Crocs. 
the Farrah Slacks, the Cecil G's, the Robert Carlos, Roberto Carlos. Uh, yeah, that's that were, right. That's were like right. a, a Gabichi. It was like yeah. a Gabichi. Yes, yeah. yes. With the suede on this. So much style. I mean, our people are so stylish. But we used to have this very eclectic thing. So I would be in a soul club beforehand in my skin tight jeans yes, and my good. kung fu slippers, you know, yes, as you do. Yes. Go home change into my Crocs, my Beaver, my Cecil G, and I'd be in the You said the Beaver? Yeah. Beaver. Oh Beaver. my God, the Beaver! <laughs> oh my bogey! Yes! <laughs> that was so expensive, the Beaver. So expensive. And the Crocs and the ostrich skin shoes. Oh, and you had to go to... Um, Davis on Edgware Road. Oh, Russell and Bromley. Russell, <laughs> Russell and Bromley. My brother introduced me to Russell and Bromley. Thank God I was always earning money. In fact, I was the only one that really had the money. Moving right now. Um, yeah. And you had to have your coat, gold tip shoe. Uh, or the chain of gold and, across yes, the front. Yes. Is that... And your Blake's on your heel to save your heel, but you make that. I, I still do, yeah. Clean. Style. <laughs> Style. Love that. So, real McCoy, how long did that last? Three years. Three years, three years in a row. And you left that to do what? I left the Real McCoy when it finished. It, it came there. to an end. It came to it? an end. And started doing some plays and stuff, but then we met up with the BB crew and we started to do work. So Beverly Michaels, she, Beverly and I went to Anna Shears together. So we... So as from far back as then? So far, we've known each other from teenagers. Really right. Time. And she saw the posse and thought, well, I want a girl's version of the posse. So she found some of the girls that she knew and I was one of those. We met up. We said, all right, I love the idea. Let's try it. Let's try it. And so we were writing, producing, directing, and it was the most fun time, because I never saw myself as a writer. I came as an actress, you give me a script, I read it, I learn it, I do it, boom. Writing, oh no. Yeah, but you see, the funny thing is with that, it's, you're learning skills all the time. You were, went in as an actress, but you're reading lines, and you're seeing how things are put together, how, plays are put together, how scripts are put together. So even though you're just learning the script, you're actually learning, oh, well, that has to fit that way for it to make sense down there. Yeah. You're learning the skill of how to write unbeknownst to you. But I'll write unbeknownst to you because I didn't stop to think yeah. like that. I was thinking this is very daunting. Yeah. But we worked as, as actors, so we would improvise, record it, Improvise, record it, somebody goes away, scripts it, come back, we look at what we've written as a text, work it again, take it away, work it. So we worked as actors on it. Yeah. And then put it together. Because it was sketch shows as sketches, it was it made it but honestly we done that very first show we done on a level. We were and then we got a bit more because we had no money, so everything was very low budget. And then Theatre Royal Stratford East because we had um oh I can I forget his name, I must remember his name who was at, he's no longer there, I can see his face, everybody's shouting his name to me. Right, close your eyes, let's see. I can see his face. Can you see his face oh as well, guys? Oh my God, I'm very I'm kind of getting an image coming through. <laughs> he will come back to me, I better come back to me. Anyway, he said, because Joanne Campbell was with us at that right. time, Joanne Campbell's no longer with us in the world anymore, and he loved Joanne Campbell. And so he, we, he brought us all in and gave us a budget that we can do our show, and we've done our show how we envisioned it to be, and not the cut version with no money. But yeah, you know, that's, that's the, um, the sad thing. A lot of these great projects, you always realize the problem is always, always, always the budget, the finance. And a lot of great work sometimes just falls by the wayside mm. because they, they can't get a budget. Yes. If they manage to scrape some pennies together to keep it going, then when it becomes a success, all the big people want to grab well, it and, and take it. And I saw that with a film called So Long, which is a new film that's been only out a couple of months. So Set in Cam Camden. Um, and literally, this film is amazing. You can see it's low budget. Now everybody, the big names, want to grab it and, and take it and run with it. And it's like, well, when we needed the money Absolutely. and we were coming to you 
for help to say this project is great. You weren't really interested. Yeah. Now that you've seen the great work we've done without a budget, you want to take it and, and lay claim to it. That, when you're, oh, Philip Headley. Philip Headley, artistic director at Theatre Royal Stratford East. Thank you, G, for remembering. My brain always thinks it gets me worried. But that is exactly what, why, why no problem came about. Yeah. Because we were successful in the theatre houses, as you know, that we just weren't represented enough. Mm, and yeah. so people came out in their droves to support the staff. Because in the 80s, there was so much more work going on. People were really putting stuff out. And, and so that's why they came to Black Theatre Co-op, because they were successful. In the same way that this film has come out, they, they, they've done it, thank goodness. And I, yeah. I really have to say, I admire the young people, because they don't have the, um, the old-fashioned way of getting stuff done. You're not going to give me money? Oh, watch how I'm going to do this. I'm going to do guerrilla warfare on this. Yeah. Going outside, I'm going to film it, I'm going to do it with this. and do Literally. That. And they do their stuff. Yeah. And I'm learning from them. We, our BB crew, are learning so much from these young people that are just doing their thing. And it's absolutely essential, I think, that whatever age group you are, if you want to remain current, you have to stay current. You have to stay up to date with what's going on. And you can't say, well, well, we used to do it that way in our day. That day's gone. This is the way they do it now. So you have no, to keep up to scratch right. with it. Yeah. You're absolutely right. There's no way you can sit back and go, mm, that's, I'm sorry, that's not how it was yeah. done. It's done. My daughter, she's uh, acting, and she, she introduced me to this whole, you can get jobs offline, you know. You can, there's a thing called Casting Call Pro. Um, uh, there's another one that's you, Casting Call Pro you have to pay for, but you get paid jobs from that one. And then there's another one that's not as expensive, but you can still get work. Which one. And I'm like, what? I've never heard of these things. And my daughter's educated me. Yeah. In other you know, things. in our day, when I remember it, we were had to go to our agent. That's right. They would give us a book of the people we had to go and see, and photographers that we had to go and take pictures with. To and you have hard tests. copies of pictures. Yeah, of hard Not copies anymore. of pictures. Everything's all online. There's, yeah. no, there's no printed pictures anymore. It's so funny to say, because Dennis, he's, he's been me long enough to know, and he's so saying to her, daughter, so where are your pictures? She goes, oh, is it? He's going, no, no, not on your phone. Where are your pictures? So I These are my pictures, but that, that, that generation is still looking for hard copy that yes. they can hold. But yes. I'm, even though I'm seeing the picture here, it's not the same. <laughs> I need to. Where is the hard copy? It's like, no, Dad, this is it. This, there's no longer no to yeah, we don't do that anymore. Anymore, no. no? We can print this for you if you want, but really, but there's prints. no need. There's no need. Everything goes online, you just push it out. So, yeah, it's just a new, new, and it, you have to stay current. Yeah. Really important to stay current. And you have to keep reinventing yourself so that you are part of what's happening now. I was at uh, the Oval House a few weeks ago. They had this... Uh, Oval House, is that in the Oval, the theatre there? The theatre, yeah, yeah. the Oval House Theatre. They asked myself, um, uh, Paulette Randall, the Doness, um, and some other women to be on the panel to talk about different because they you know they get a new building. Right, Re Princeton. really? Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be amazing. So it's from our perspective, from different points, our director, actors, stuff. What would you do with the building? How would it serve you? So that was great. There was this woman on there called Lynette on the panel, young girl, must be in her twenties. Wow. Talking about how she first wrote something, she approached someone, they didn't want it, she had to do all this work, and it was about a mixed race girl, she wrote it. I think it was ended up at the Ocola that her play ended up being. Lovely little theatre. Beautiful theatre, really lovely. In Dalston, is it? Yeah. Dalston Junction, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice theatre. Then I was at uh, the Bush not too long ago because um, Man Mandani, how do you say his name? Mandani. Madani. Madani yeah. has left. Oh, is he gone? He's gone. Oh, he's right. at South Bank. He's got a job at South Bank. <gasps> oh, no. Well Hello. done. You know him? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, you better get in there. The new person that's taken over as the artistic director. Not the same little young girl in it. Really? How's this? Good said, on you. You didn't say. You didn't say. She goes, I didn't know. I didn't know at the time. It was down to me. I am so happy. Mm. Young, energetic. Fresh. Fresh. And has, and has done the work. She's been out there pushing her stuff, so she's not no naive yeah. person who doesn't understand how the world runs. She knows, she's young, but she knows how the world she's, works. Exactly. 
Uh, and you realise it's not really about age, it's about experience. It is. And you could have lived to 60 or 70. It doesn't necessarily mean you've had the same experience that a 30 or 40 year old has had. So. Absolutely. And her experience was vast when she was talking. And so when I saw it was her, I was jumping up and down. I was like, I don't even know her from that night, you know. I don't know her from before, but I feel but you were just, yeah, like the I've energy, known each yeah, other yeah, yeah, the ages. energy. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she brings down to the bush. So when did the fitness come into play? Oh, OK. So I've always so you trained. need to see this figure. Yeah. This is a tight figure going on here. OK. Tight, tight. I've always <laughs> trained. I've always trained. Sit up! <laughs> <laughs> I, I've done martial arts. Uh, there was a guy called Ruben Joseph. He's no longer with us in this world, but he was my first Sifu. And he'd done an art called Wailing, which was based in Wing Chun, but it okay. was Wailing, was his thing. And I was doing angels when I was started to train. And then somebody hit me in my mouth, and when I was doing the <laughs> film, there was, uh, you know what's weird? When you're trying to sound, you go, oh, i done this because I was training it. And they go, oh, yeah, it's all right, dude, we understand. <laughs> no, no, I really didn't. They thought Debbie's had been hitting me. And the more you, I noticed, the more I was trying to convince them, it the sounded. The going, yes, we, we believe you, yes, Judy. it was. It's really, it, it's OK. <laughs> no, another one, OK. It, it, it was. And I, and I can see it in their faces. And the more I can see in their faces, the more desperate I became to show you. <laughs> it's it's not, not, not that. It's not that. Anyway, they decided they're never going to hit me in the face again. Because I went and I went, listen, guys, you cannot hit me in the face because I'm not going to be defending my And you're man. giving me a reputation for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> all the wrong reasons. <laughs> so I was doing that in Angels. And then, um, and then I just got the bug. And when I was carried on training and training myself. And then when I went for patches of because this business can be beautiful and it can be as awful at the same time. I always say it's like the tide. Money is like the tide in this industry. Sometimes it comes in and sometimes it goes out. Oh, yeah. But just wait there. It'll come back yeah, in at some point. It'll come back in at some point. Sometimes you have to write a picture. It's just that it seems so to go out quicker than it comes in. Stage, <laughs> I thought, OK, because it was actually a couple of my girlfriends. It was um, Marjorie, who was the, the, the partner of Ruben, who was my Kung Fu instructor. He said to me, Jude, you like training. Why don't you teach fitness? Yeah. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to just train. I don't want to be standing there teaching. Them. Said, OK, but you really do like it, so you should think about it. And somebody else said the same thing. I went, OK, so I've done some courses and started teaching fitness. And you know what's weird, because as performers, you actually get to perform, don't you? It's a performance anyway. And eight more. Follow her, you just yeah. sashay around. Cause yeah. then you then learn how to teach rather than performing. Yes. Because, you know, the older you get, you can stay in the industry forever, but you do less because yes. you're thinking, well, this is my fifth class for the day. This is your one. And when they're yeah. going, oh, you don't do anything. Oh, my God, come here. Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you don't do anything. Yeah, this is your one hour, darling. I've been doing this. Absolutely. Exactly. And actually, I'm not there to train me. <laughs> I'm there to you to train. To train. Exactly. I've got my training. I do my training. Thank you very much. Trust well. me, you don't want to train with me. You don't want to train with me. I do tell them that. So you teach classes? I teach classes. Regular, on a regular, on a regular, on a regular basis? basis? And I'm a freelancer. Nice. Because that's how I can go off and do my do business. Do what you think. Get back. your little cover done. Yeah, you get your little cover in and go about your business. And it's been quite a journey for me, this whole fitness thing. Because I didn't know how long I was actually doing it. And so someone said, how long have you been doing it? Oh, well, only a few years. And then I looked at my certificates. I went, OK. It's maybe doing like... a bit more than a few years. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, because when, if you're still in the industry yeah. and they're saying, any more certificates? And I'm saying, well, listen, I've done everything right up to date. But when I'm looking at some of the old certificates, you're going, that says 1989, and that says 1993. OK, maybe I'm... When I see and some 19, of these people, yeah. yeah, some of these people weren't even born when you did the first <laughs> exam. Yeah. So, you know, the exercise to yes. music. Exercise to music. <laughs> That's That's right. Right. <laughs> I don't think people even do that anymore. I don't think I so. I think there is a whole course that yeah. you end up doing lots of stuff that said modules. You just don't have to do more Well, ours was really, the exercise stuff. to music was the foundation that for was the everything. That foundation. And then but you can that's why stuff. those freelance instructors level is so high. The in-house instructors, 
they just teach them one format. Whereas us, we learn exercise to music, then you did your step, you yes. did pump, you did everything yes. separately. We're freelancers, so for us to be employed, we have to make sure that our people that we're teaching yeah. are getting the best out of The best. Yeah. yeah. So we have to work that little bit harder, but that's fine. I so you're a busy, to... busy girl. I am a busy girl. What does this busy girl do to look after herself? I Apart from go to Gambia whenever she can. Well, yeah, you know that's the main thing, going to Gambia. Well, What's your regular practice to say, keep you calm, keep your equilibrium, you know, just you know keep you rested I, and fresh? Training is one of the things, but yes. actually swimming, I like to go and have a swim. Nice. And then sit in the steam room and the sauna, and that's me, my time. Right. I love, that to me is the same as when I play music, because it's only about me. That it's not about me having to do this for this person or do that for anybody else. This is just me. So when I'm swimming, it's me. I'm just there. Because it's a new form of freedom for me, swimming. Right. And then to sit in the steam room, and we have, I, I live in Tottenham, so we have a, a vast majority of people, a vast array of people, I should say, and you hear all these different accents. And I sit in the steam room and they go, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's different languages, that. different like, accents. Languages. I, I, I remember um, being asked by Paul Medford, if you had one wish and you can't say you want to feed everybody, what would it be? And I couldn't think of it. I came with something stupid. And then he said he would like to speak every language. And I thought, yeah. Like every time I sit in that steam room, I wish I could speak. Could uh, communicate with whoever's in there, and, or at least understand at what they're saying. At least understand. Yeah. But my girlfriend, she's born in Eritrea, but she was there before the divide, so she can speak. Well, she was, she was shifted to Sweden, so she can speak Swedish, she can speak English, she can speak um, Eritrean, she can understand the Ethiopians. She's just... I sit, when a we, linguist, she, yeah. When we sit in the steam room, I'm going to what they're saying, what they're saying. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And then, because they don't know where that, she, she is, she, because she could be Somali, you know, Eritrean or Ethiopian, she could be any of those stuff. And then they'll start speaking and she'll go to them, blah, 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 and she'll talk back and they'll go, they'll go to oh, you just just, no, I'm in dream, but I can understand it because before the split, everybody could speak. Speak the same language, or at least very similar. Oh, at least similar, similar. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a big thing. I wish I did teach, start teaching myself Spanish. Okay. And I would say I wanted to learn Spanish because I know outside of Africa, Brazil has the biggest amount of Africans outside. So I wanted to converse with more Africans. And, and we know there's so many languages in Africa with so many different countries. So if I can communicate. And then I thought, I'm in Egypt because actually it's Portuguese. In Brazil, speak, yeah. In Brazil. But, you know, I just got to think about oh, these people. Yeah, yeah, I got to think about it. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> but you know they can understand each other. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah because, they can. There was this uh, Portuguese guy in the gym, and there was a Spanish girl, and this Portuguese guy was so gorgeous, and everybody, everybody in the gym did this. You're the guy in the gym. They were training, we're going, oh, dear, oh, he's so lovely. And this girl went, oh, I can talk to him. I said, no, you can't, you're Spanish. She went, he can understand me. And she went, and we're going, no, he doesn't. She went, she went up to him and said, and he started talking to him. Oh, she talking. got him, she got him. <laughs> you nutcase. That was my moment I wanted to learn Spanish. So, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so what are your future endeavours, my girl? Future endeavours is BB Crew and I, we're still writing, doing stuff. So we're writing some stuff. We are, we're writing some stuff that we want to put for television, but writing for television doesn't, there's no guarantees for anything, yeah. but you've got to be in it to win it. So that's our motto, so we're doing it. We've got a play that we've given to an amazing lady called Trish Cook, who's a writer, and we started it. We've got so many balls in the basket that we can't possibly keep them all moving, so we yeah. have to dedicate to people that we trust and love. Trish Cook, we trust and love her to the bone, and she's... And she's, it's good that you have someone that you can trust and love in that situation, because yes. a lot of times it's like you come with your great ideas, next minute, they're yes, there you're ideas. Right, you're right, you're right, actually. <laughs> you're right. Thinking, Hold on a minute, I never heard back from them, yes. and that script's mine. <laughs> you know that's happened a few times, yeah. you know what I mean? No, that's happened with big shows, that's yeah. happened. But we do, and she's 
camera, oh, I'm so, but Trish is in demand because she is so amazing. Yeah. And Theatre Royal Stratford East always use her to do their pantomimes and she writes all, every year she writes the pantomime down there. But she's been just being given some tenure in some university. Okay. <sighs> My God, she's written children's books. She's written. She's she she's the donest. Lovely. She's a donest, and to, to have Trish with us about this. Yeah, Trish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So that's what we're writing for our future is to is to try to be in some sort of control, because this business we have no control. We're normally waiting on the on the graces of somebody to say, "Yay, you were good enough. Yeah. You got the part." Yeah. And honestly, people always say to me. Um, Oh, uh, I want to be an actor. What, what is it? And I, what, 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 what you give me as a tip? And I say, learn to accept rejection because that is the biggest thing in this business. In most things, though, modelling, fashion, acting, singing, as you see arts. in all those competitions, yeah. once you're involved in the arts, you have to get that tough skin. You do. You can't think that, okay, they don't like me, so my life's over, because <laughs> that, that's just for yes. that particular thing yes. and those particular people. But out there, you know, there are lots of other opportunities. And that classic line is from Meryl Streep. When she first started her career, they said she was ugly, she couldn't act, and she didn't get the first part. But that almost gave her the inspiration to keep going. Yes. That you'd rejected me, but I know I'm better than you're saying I am. Now look at them, they must feel well, absolute idiots. Good for her, good for her. You have to believe in yourself. Yourself, at yeah, first, if you want you other people to, to, you have, to have confidence because in you. Because you, you will always go through self-doubt, you know, and the imposter syndrome. Yeah. And as I tell you, I had that imposter syndrome not too long ago. But the beauty is being with other women that you're working with. And you can go in. I had, I had a little meltdown session. I had a couple of jobs that I went for that I really wanted I didn't get. Right. And I say a couple was more than two. And I came into the meeting, it was me and one of the other ladies in there, and I was going to her, oh, I just feel like I'm not even meant to be in this profession anymore. anymore. Yeah. And she went, what? And then she went into hers. And I was like, she took over my pain. It was now her pain. Yeah. And then so much so, she ended up crying. I was hugging her. I went to her, you know, it was about me, me. right? You yeah. realised that. She went, oh, As sorry. Usual, I'm it was taking about over. Me. Yeah. She goes, I've taken over. I said, yeah, you have. But it's all right. It just made me feel better because you think you're on your own. You're the back. only one going through yeah but as you say that self-confidence and it's a fine line between conceit and arrogance and self-confidence they're not the same thing they're not the same you have to have that self-belief but still be humble yes you know but without so self -belief, that self -belief. But you have to have that confidence even with teaching even if you don't know what you're doing say what you're saying with conviction oh yes you have say it with conviction flag it baby flag it till it's real in. yeah yeah but why you have to have that self-belief is because of the rejection yeah and if you don't think that you are actually you don't think you're the best but you're good, good enough you're good, good enough. enough you're good enough you're good enough yeah to be doing we've all doing. been through that and then and then you get no and you get another no and you get your tenth no then if you don't think actually and you know what I did? Because people send stuff on WhatsApp all the time to me, and somebody sent me a sketch from the Royal McCoy right. when I was going through my self-doubt stage. And I went, that's you! What? You, you're okay, you know, Jude. You're, you're okay! Me good. You're okay, man! You can do this job! You can do this job! Yeah. So I thought, okay, great. And at the timing of that sent it to me, they, could, they would never... Well, they always say, everything happens time. for a reason and nothing before time. Right. My darling, thank you so much. It's been a Your royal pleasure. Highness. Let me have a proper kiss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No tongues. No. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Judith, darling, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for fitting us in. I know you're busy, so it's we're very great. appreciative thank for your you company so much, today. Really Guys, if that wasn't inspirational, then I don't know what is. Judith Jacobs with us today on Live Well with Barry. As usual, if there's anything that resonates with you, please leave us a note, leave us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, see you around. Bye.